Hey everyone, Ryan Kennedy here. Welcome back to the show. In today's episode, I'm going to be discussing the main blood tests that I have people run in my functional medicine practice to really get a good understanding of their current health status, what imbalances they may have, and really helps me determine what protocols I'm going to design to best help them with the issue or challenge they're coming to me for help for. And so, you know, a lot of times I don't even do any advanced testing off the get-go because lifestyle changes, you know, are going to be a foundational element regardless of what comes back on the test. When it comes to just bettering your health, making sure you're dialing in your sleep, your stress management, movement, nutrition, you know, all the fundamentals, that's going to go across the board for everyone, no matter what issue you have. But it can really, blood testing and, you know, more specifically functional medicine testing can really give you a good idea of what's going on, especially for individuals who have digestive issues or gut health challenges, hormone imbalances, who, you know, kind of tried a lot of the basics already and are already living a healthy lifestyle, yet they're still having trouble in some capacity, and whether it be with energy, whether it be with sex drive, whether it be with something else altogether or a combination of things. And so blood testing can be a little tricky. Uh, simply because when you go through your general practitioner, you know, a family medicine doctor, uh, and, you know, they're dealing with insurance companies, they typically don't want to run functional medicine labs to actually get a good understanding of what's going on. And you may be wondering, like, why not? Well, that issue really comes back to insurance and modern medicine and some of the issues surrounding that paradigm and that system. And also a lot of ignorance and, and arrogance on the side of the physician because they aren't taught about these tests. You know, it's not typically not typical in a standard medicine practice and they have a lack of understanding. It's not a lack of desire to help you. I believe everyone has good intentions that gets into this field, but they're just not equipped with the knowledge to know about these things and to really understand why they're, you know, the benefits and why these tests can really provide a lot of insight. So if you go into, you know, a physician, for let's just say an annual checkup, you know, just a general physical, they're typically gonna run three things for you. They're gonna run a CBC, which is a complete blood count. It'll show you your red blood cells, your white blood cells, all that sort of stuff. They'll run a basic metabolic panel. That'll have things like electrolytes, uh, liver and kidney function, like your AST and ALT liver enzymes, your kidney function looking at creatinine and you know estimated glomerular filtration rate. And then they're typically going to run a very basic lipid panel, looking at total cholesterol, HDL, LDL, and triglycerides. And that's about it. Now, you maybe hear this list and think, wow, that's, that's a lot of stuff, Ryan. Well, it's really not. You know, these markers are oftentimes not out of whack unless you're having some really serious imbalances or really serious issues. And many people come to me for help in my practice have a long list of symptoms and health challenges, yet their basic blood work from their MD came back totally normal. So these tests can provide some direction, and I'm not saying they're not valuable, because they are a good place to start for a lot of folks. But there's a couple of issues. First of all, the tests aren't using optimal reference ranges. They're using average reference ranges. And the way that they come up with these reference ranges on these lab, te lab tests is they just take a basic you know, category of people who are disease free. These are not necessarily healthy individuals, they're just average population. And they basically create a chart and they take the median and that's your reference range. But like I said, they're not taking optimally healthy people. They're not taking people who are really, really dialed in. They're just taking average people who don't have, you know, diagnosed chronic condition. So that's one thing. But when you're looking at opti optimal reference ranges, those basic labs can give you some direction into what areas to look at more. You know, if your liver enzymes are a little elevated, you can look at some detoxification protocols and potentially some liver support. If you have some, you know, out of whack lipid panel with your cholesterol numbers or your triglycerides, you can look into different protocols to help with metabolic health and to really help clean up some of the uh, fats within our bodies with good antioxidants like vitamin E, vitamin C, you know, and so on and so forth. So. I'm not going down, down too deep a rabbit hole with all these uh, examples. This is why I really like to look at functional medicine labs and look at a variety of things that go above and beyond these basics because it really gives you a clear understanding of if this person has hormone imbalances, if they have thyroid issues, if they have inflammation-related problems, looking at things like high-sensitivity 
a high sensitivity C-reactive protein, maybe they have nutrient deficiencies, uh, lack of blood sugar stability, you know, looking at their uh, markers for glycemic variability, things like hemoglobin A1C and fasting insulin, uh, and a whole host of other important variables that really dictate how our bodies are functioning. So when I run blood work for people I work with, which I do all the time, I run it for my students, for my patients, uh, I really look at other in-depth functional medicine labs. Uh, I particularly like one called organic acids test, which looks at imbalances in the gut. You know, things like candida overgrowth or SIBO or mold or mycotoxin exposure or C. diff and other potential gut issues that can really cause a lot of digestive distress when people get bloating or gas or don't feel well after meals or have abdominal pain or irregular bowel movements. A lot of times that's a gut imbalance. And these blood markers, the standard CBC, standard lipid profile, it's not going to help you to determine what is imbalanced in your gut, in your microbiome. Uh, the organic acids test, well, the thing I love about it is in addition to looking at gut health, it also measures mitochondrial function, which is critical for energy, uh, neurotransmitter balance. So if someone has mild depression or someone has anxiety or mood issues, that's going to be really, really key to look at to see, hey, do you have low dopamine? Do we need to bring in some dopamine precursors like L-tyrosine or, or dopaminuca? And then also looking at the vitamin status and a bunch of other markers. So that's a really, really solid test. And I always aim for tests that are non-invasive and easy to do. So the thing I love about organic acids test is it's an at-home urine test. It takes two minutes to do the sample. You don't have to go in and you know pluck your arm, get blood drawn, all that type of jazz. You can just do it from the comfort of your own home and it's super easy, super simple. Uh, and then I'll also sometimes couple that and run uh, stool microbiome tests. Uh, sometimes I'll run uh, food sensitivity tests, you know, like looking at a blood panel of IgG food sensitivities if someone's having a lot of reactions to different foods. Uh, and, you know, other tests, depending on what the person is coming to me for help with, depending on their budget, depending on, you know, what kind of progress and results we're getting prior to running these tests. And then this can further help direct the protocols and recommendations I give them. And like I said before, oftentimes we won't run any tests. I'll just go straight to implementing protocols with someone. So it really depends on the context and the situation. Um, but always feel free to reach out to me if you could use some guidance and support. If you'd like to set up an initial consultation, feel free to send me an email, uh, ryankennedyhealth at gmail.com. Send me a message on social media because it really is hard to navigate this stuff if you don't have an in-depth understanding of what to look for. And the thing I do love about testing is when you're not testing, you're kind of guessing. You're just trying to figure out, you know, based on the symptoms, based on, you know, my intake forms, based on the symptomology, what's likely the problem. But when you have the test, you can really see objectively, here's what's going on. Here's how we're going to fix it. And then we can retest three to six months later to show that issue has been resolved. In addition to, of course, the important parameters of the resolution of symptoms and issues that that person is having. All right, so on to the good stuff. I'm going to really dive into some of the top functional medicine blood tests I like to, to run uh, that gives you a good analysis of one's health. Uh, and these would be things in addition to the basic blood panel I mentioned, the basic C, uh, complete blood count, complete metabolic profile, and basic lipid panel. Those are pretty typical, like I said. So going beyond that, I love to look at what's called hemoglobin A1C, HA1C. This is an important um, marker that kind of measures your average blood sugar over the past three months. So it's really important for this concept of glycemic variability, which I've talked about in prior episodes of keeping your blood sugar stable. And a lot of people will get their fasting glucose run, but fasting glucose is not adequate. It's really just a snapshot. It's just a snapshot in time. And so hemoglobin A1C is going to be a much better test. And something I'll also run if I'm working with someone who has blood sugar or uh, weight issues uh, is going to be fasting insulin to really see if they have some insulin resistance or if that's kind of out of whack. Okay, moving on to number two, we have looking at sex hormones. I love to look at uh, total testosterone, free testosterone, sex hormone binding globulin, especially in men, because looking at total testosterone is only part of the picture. You have to see how much bioavailable free testosterone is there and a lot of men have high what's called sex hormone binding globulin and it's binding up a lot of the total testosterone so their body's not able to really utilize it and so that's a really important factor since many of you listening to this understand testosterone is a critical sex hormone 
not just for sex drive and libido, but also for energy and vitality and just having a good zest for life. Uh, and then, you know, for women, I like to run estradiol, progesterone, and, you know, a few others that can really help to determine, you know, why a woman might have imbalances and caught, you know, symptoms when it comes to her menstrual cycle or when it comes to her mood or uh, weight loss issues or weight loss resistance. Uh, very important to look at because low testosterone for guys and estrogen dominance or uh, high testosterone for women, which is oftentimes a uh, you know, byproduct of having PCOS, uh, can really disrupt our quality of life. It can really disrupt your energy, your drive. Uh, it can also have impairments on your sleep, your skin, your hair, your body composition, like your muscle mass, your fat mass, and so much more. So these sex hormones are really critical. So when I'm working to resolve hormone imbalances, I always do so naturally. You know, I'm not against bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. I don't use that in my practice. I refer out to that, uh, to a very skilled physician that knows their stuff when that's the case. But it's, you know, always trying to resolve the root cause from a lifestyle nutritional component is going to be the best choice. And then using the latter option of hormone replacement therapy in the right context when the natural options have already been exhausted. That can be a good, a good a way to go about it. So moving on, number three, I have a, a thyroid panel. I love to look at thyroid because typically when someone is having thyroid issues like low energy, hair loss, hair thinning, uh, or even things like weight gain or weight loss resistance, it's oftentimes due to poor thyroid um, function. So I like to look at a full thyroid panel. I'll look at TSH, which is thyroid stimulating hormone. I'll look at T3, reverse T3, T4, and also thyroid antibodies to see if the person has an autoimmune related condition. Uh, and this is gonna shed a lot of light because the thyroid is very important for our energy, for our um, body composition, and maintaining good metabolic health and uh, you know a healthy weight. Very, very key, and a lot of folks have thyroid issues because and they're not getting adequate amounts of two of the most important nutrients for our thyroid. And that would be iodine and selenium. You know, we have all these iodine receptors on our thyroid. And when we're deficient in iodine, we'll get a lot of these chemicals in our environment latching onto these thyroid receptors, primarily fluoride, chlorine, and bromine, because they're all halogens on the periodic table. So they'll take the place of the thyroid in these receptor sites and poison the thyroid tissue take the place of iodine rather, I misspoke there. So it'll take the place of the iodine because you don't have any iodine coming in or not enough. It'll poison the thyroid tissue and cause thyroid uh, dysfunction essentially. And so that's really important to look at. And so, you know, once you kind of see what's off, you can then make appropriate protocols and you know, someone's on a very strict ketogenic diet long-term that could run in, you know, they could run into some thyroid issues. If I see this a lot in women who are doing like intermittent fasting and drinking a whole bunch of coffee in the morning and not getting any nutrition in their bodies until later in the day, because I heard online from some, you know, fitness guru that intermittent fasting is the bee's knees. Well, now they are running into thyroid issues because they're not doing it appropriately for their bodies. And I talk about this a lot in my episode, prior episode on meal timing and how that is gonna differ between men and women and what women really need to be mindful of when it comes to breakfast and dinner and you know just doing it in a way that's conducive to their biology. Moving on to number four, we have vitamin D3. You need to run a 25-hydroxy vitamin D3 test, not D2, which is the synthetic form. This is one of the single most important vitamins in the body, and the only way you know how much to supplement with is by testing your levels. There's no way you can figure it out otherwise. You know, race, gender, age, ethnicity, none of it really matters. We all absorb uh, vitamin D differently. And so of course, if you live close to the equator, you're getting lots of sensible sun exposure, your need for vitamin D is going to be much less than someone who's living in a harsh winter, cold climate, not getting any sun. But with that being said, even if you're getting sun, even if you're living in a warm climate, you still may have suboptimal vitamin D levels. And on the flip side, other people may be living in a cool climate, but they're taking a couple thousand IUs of vitamin D and their body's absorbing it, absorbing it phenomenally well. They might not need much more than that. So everyone's different. I can't give out any blanket recommendations on the amounts for these different things because it's very individualized. You know, one person may need 2,000 IUs of vitamin D3 every day 
to get their levels where I want them, which is between 60 and 80 uh, nano, nanomoles per deciliter. Another person may, nan, nanograms per deciliter, I'm sorry. Uh, and that's United States um, units. Other countries use a different unit measurement, so it's a little bit different. Whereas other people may need 12 or 15,000 IUs. It's not common to need that much. You know, a typical average people really benefit from 5,000 IUs daily, but it's very dependent on the individual. And the only way you know is you take the same amount of vitamin D3 every day for at least three months. It takes about 90 days to really saturate the intracellular levels and know where that amount of vitamin D is going to leave your body. So after three months of consistent dosage of let's say 5,000 IUs, you test your vitamin D. If it's in that range, you're good to go. If it's below that range, you may up your dose to 6,000 or 7,000 IUs and then get it retested in another three to six months and see where you're at. Moving on from vitamin D, we have number five, which is high sensitivity C-reactive protein. This is a great marker of inflammation in the body. Inflammation being a root cause of so much dysfunction, and this will really help to determine, do you have high levels of inflammation? And if that marker is elevated, uh, especially if it's above one, I like to see it below one, uh, that will definitely indicate some need for some changes in your diet, some changes in your lifestyle, bringing in more anti-inflammatory foods, and maybe some targeted nutritional supplements to really help bring that inflammation down. Uh, next is homocysteine. This is an inflammatory metabolite that is typically elevated when someone has low B vitamin status, particularly B6 and B12 in their bioavailable form. And I see this a lot with women. Um, especially women who are on a vegetarian or vegan diet because it's hard to get adequate B vitamins through plant sources. We really get the most bioavailable source of B vitamins through animal foods, high quality grass fed meats and organ meats. And so this is something I see all the time is elevated homocysteine, which is not good. You want that number lower and something to definitely keep an eye out for if you do some blood labs. And it won't tell you necessarily whether you're low in B6 or B12, um, but I'll usually bring them both in, bring in some folate um, in the converted form, methylfolate, and then also bring in some vitamin B12 um, in the, the, the right form, methylcobalamin, and that's gonna be really, really beneficial. And then the next uh, number seven is ferritin. Ferritin is our body's iron storage molecule in the body. And it's commonly elevated in men because we tend to bioaccumulate iron. And when it gets too high, it starts to become an oxidative stressor. So it's very simple to normalize your levels. You just donate blood. But I see high ferritins in the two to 400 range in men in my practice all the time. And it can really cause long-term harm. And on the flip side, I see really low ferritin in women because women men menstruate, especially if you're during, you know, let's say you're between the ages of, you know, teenage years and, 40 or 50 years old, and you're in your menstruating phase of your life, as far as your hormones go, oftentimes iron will be low, especially if that woman is not eating adequate um, grass-fed meat. One of the best sources of heme iron that we could actually absorb. Plant sources of iron aren't very absorbable. They're not very bioavailable. So ferritin is really good to look at. I like to see levels between 40 and 100. That's really the optimal range in my book. Um, if it's a little higher, I'm not too concerned. If it's a little lower than 40, I'm not too concerned. But when you start to get way out of that range, that's cause for uh, some intervention to, to normalize that and to really bring it into that optimal range. Number eight would be magnesium RBC, magnesium uh, status in the red blood cell. You have to look at intracellular nutrient status because serum magnesium is almost useless. You know, honestly, the thing about serum levels of most nutrients is it's not going to be a good indication. You could take magnesium the day before or that morning before your blood work and have high serum levels. But if you run in uh, magnesium RBC, you might have low magnesium status. So magnesium being one of the most important master minerals in our bodies, I think it's worth looking at and can really be um, beneficial to know where that is to know if you should be taking more magnesium or not. And again, the amount is very dependent on the individual. Some individuals I have supplementing with you know, 100 milligrams of magnesium twice a day. Other people need much, much more than that. So it really does depend. So I could talk all day about a whole bunch of other markers, but what I listed are really the low hanging fruit, the most important markers to look at for the vast majority of individuals. And is really gonna shed some insight into your health, different imbalances in your body. Uh, and if you're feeling freaking awesome, 
and you don't have any health issues, I wouldn't worry about going and getting all this testing done. It's not free. You know, so oftentimes you can get your insurance to cover a lot of these tests. It just depends on your physician, depends on your insurance. Uh, but ultimately, it's more so for people who are dealing with one or multiple health issues that this becomes really helpful to look at to get some direction to know like, hey, this is where this is the part of your body or this is the, the system in the body that's not operating correctly. These might be the issues. Here's how we can correct it. And so, like I said at the beginning of this episode, feel free to send me an email briankennedyhealth at gmail.com for more information regarding you know working together in my private practice any blood testing any questions you have for me um, anything of that nature and if you send any questions I'll add them to my upcoming Q&A episode so I hope you enjoyed this episode I look forward to bringing you more empowering episodes to help you optimize every aspect of your health and your life much love everyone Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode. If you found it helpful, please share it along to anyone else you believe it can serve. You can find the show notes and resources we discussed at ryankennedyshow.com. Be sure to subscribe and leave a review for the show. Your feedback helps to support me on my mission to positively impact as many people as possible with this information. Much love, everyone.